So I've chosen to talk to you this evening about designing with computers, which to me is a bit of an antidote from what I hear a lot of my generation talking about, which is we must teach the kids how to design without computers. So you'll gather as I go through what I mean by that, I think. So I'm going to intersperse it, of course, with projects, because in the end, that's what I really care about, is designing things myself. And the first one is the city of Manchester Stadium. So all the projects I've chosen are from the sort of second half of my career so far, hopefully the middle third by the time I finish. And this one is from 1999, 2000. It is um, the stadium in Manchester. I'm, what I think I'm most proud about of this stadium and what we achieved is that it was remarkably efficient. It cost £55 million for the stadium itself, which for a 50,000-seat football stadium is, is quite a remarkable achievement. We did that by adding nothing more than what was needed. So it's an integrated piece of design where every little piece is there for a reason, if you like, and there is no added decoration. But the structural part is, for me, the roof story, because that's the bit I was most involved with. And we established this set of cables which are what's known as form found into place. That is, we find a geometry where all the forces we wish to have in the various cables are in balance with each other. It is funicular to the pre-stressed loads that we've applied to it. And we make sure that the loads, the pre-stresses, are appropriate for the forces that we're going to then deliver to this cable net from the roof itself. But the trick was that the cable net is not the same surface or geometry as the roof itself. So we divorced what was necessary structurally from what we wanted to achieve visually or architecturally, which was a simple cylindrical surface set underneath the cable net. It's not something I've done it very often or have come across very often, this idea that structure and form can be divorced one from the other. Normally our structure is the enclosure of our buildings, for example. They're normally one and the same thing. So it's to say that the structural geometry and the building geometry can be totally separated was, I think, quite special. And this is the result. You get this idea that this um, really very delicate cylindr cylindrical roof, but it doesn't have enough curvature to do a proper job of work structurally. So instead, the cable net above has a greater curvature, and also we took the opportunity to pull it down in the corners to take uplift, so we've got a reversible system, which is quite difficult to do with cables. There is a little piece that I just want to dwell upon, because sometimes it's little things that make a big difference. And I can't even claim credit for this. This was an, a South African engineer by Alan Jones, called Alan Jones, who was um, visiting us in London, who came up with this idea. And this is the problem with a cable stayed roof, is you end up with this thrust going back down the roof itself. And you have to resolve that somehow at the back of the stadium. The simple way of dealing with it would be just to turn up the raking beam, the beam that's carrying the seating plats, and get it to resist the thrust, which is quite capable of doing. That's not a difficult thing, but it is potentially um, a wrong thing, again, from a visual perspective, because you've tried to lift this roof and float it above the stadium, and then you put a great big knuckle at the back, and so you won't get necessarily what you want. And Alan came up with this really elegant solution of said, if we put a raking strut towards the back of the roof, it's simply now, the roof itself thinks as though it's being suspended from two equal cables. One going to the near the front, one going to near the back. The roof beam now has a central span and two balancing cantilevers, or two cantilevers and a balancing central span, depending on how you want to look at these things, and can be reduced in size at both ends. And we get inside, as you can see on the left here, there's those raking struts, where we also put the back enclosure of the stadium on the same angle. And so on the right-hand slide, you see we can float this roof visually completely above the bulb. It's a bit of sleight of hand, if you will, slightly cheating, maybe not, because it is a pure force diagram, so it's a straightforward thing. The other thing I learned from previous stadiums, which we put into place in Manchester, again, is a non-structural thing, which is to lean the mast backwards. They should be lent forwards if you're after pure structural efficiency. Then they'd be shorter. And in compression, of course, they'd then be considerably smaller. But I have no doubt that we look at masts as though they're somehow their mass is helping to support the roof, balancing the roof, which is you know, going out in front. So you want this mass out the back, cantilevering against. It's not true, of course. The mass of the mast is very trivial compared to the mass of the roof. But it does look right. 
So there's a little bit of this, you know, using your judgment to try and decide what is right and what is wrong by exploring what the possibilities are and then making a decision. So it's, to me, a lot of engineering is not about absolutes. It's about making decisions based on judgment. So me, a little interlude. Um, I am fundamentally a structural engineer. I'm a practitioner. Okay? I spend my time roughly half and half, half designing structures and leading projects, and half the time as part of the leadership, a member of the leadership team in Arab. I find this a fantastic thing to do and be paid to do because I'm doing what I really enjoy in terms of designing buildings and I'm helping to lead a firm that I'm totally and utterly in love with. I've been there all my life. I've never worked anywhere else. I wouldn't want to work anywhere else. I apologise to anybody here from any other organisation. <laughs> but I, I'm in love with my organisation, if you like. And so it's, you know, I can't imagine having a better career than the one I've had to date. A caveat, though, is I'm not an academic. So I'm pretty loose with words and expressions, and I apologise again if I offend anybody by using them in the wrong place or the wrong order. And the last characteristic, I think, for me, apart from, as mentioned in my introduction, that I've spent more years working outside the UK than I have working inside the UK, is I have always used computers as a design aid. I was very lucky that when I joined the firm in 1981, computers were just entering the mainstream of structural engineering. And I joined this group called the Lightweight Structures Laboratory, I think. I'm not sure whether it was Jack or Duncan who's responsible for this expression, maybe neither of them. But anyway, I was fortunate enough to be chosen. 15 people volunteered to be the graduates, joining two expert engineers in designing lightweight structures. And I got chosen, and, I've, and I enjoyed it thoroughly because there were no rules. Nobody designed these things to codes. It was all working out from first principles. And we were in a transition from form-finding things using soap films and, and net stockings and all sorts of physical models to doing it computationally. So I helped write some of the software that form-found lightweight structures, which I still use today. It's still using dynamic relaxation, part of my toolkit, if you will. But the interesting thing, or the funny thing, the curious thing, is I once asked, how come they chose me out of the 15 volunteers? You know, how, how did I get the good job? And I was told it was because apparently I knew all about designing steelwork. <laughs> I sort of cogitate about this. And the only thing I can remember is, as a graduate of Cambridge University, telling somebody on arrival in Arab that I knew nothing about concrete. <laughs> 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 From which... Somebody made an erroneous assumption, but never mind. <laughs> I've enjoyed it ever since. So computers, part of what I'm talking about today is, um, you know, what are they? They do all sorts of things. This is very important to me. They're not just analysis engines. Right? They are. They're big calculators. But they're also, we now rely on them totally for communication. They're where we get our information. They manage processes via various different tools. And increasingly, we're going to use them, in my view, for data analytics and visualisation, the so-called big data that we hear quite a lot of talk about. So they are a fundamental part of modern life, whether we grew up with them or not. So I'm now going to be slightly um, pejorative, maybe, and compare two generations of people, <laughs> us and them. I'm a baby boomer, but most of the people in our office now are millennials. There's two great humps in the population, at least of the UK and the developed world. The baby boomers and the millennials. And there's a poor Generation X is squashed in between that we tend to gloss over a little bit. <laughs> I won't read all, out all these different things. Whether they're right, wrong or indifferent really doesn't matter. But there are a couple of ones under the millennials that I want to point out. And these were lifted from a PwC survey. I'm not sure how many people they surveyed. But they found that millennials, in choosing who to work for, said that two of the strong things that they use to choose where they're going to work is they want to have strong mentors and coaches, and they want to collaborate with inspiring colleagues. So it's the other people in the organisation, and particularly the other senior people in the organisation, that they're looking for. But we approach computers in two very different ways, in my experience. The baby boomers want to design things from first principles. They want to be able to sketch things on the back of a napkin, talk about it over lunch or over dinner, and then they want to analyse it to prove it works. Yeah? That's their order of doing things. It's partly because we're brought up without them. 
So we had to make do with working things out by hand. Whereas the millennials want to dive in and try it out from the very beginning. They want to use technology and learn through its use. They can't imagine not using technology. It's what they've used all their lives. If they can use their smartphone all the time to communicate with their friends, why on earth can't they use their computer to design structures? Yeah. And so there's a gap here growing in attitude to what computers are for and how we should go about it. It's just compounded by something that David Nethercott pointed out to me the other day when I said that this is what I was going to talk about tonight. He said it's also compounded that now that we're more efficient at what we do as structural engineers, we use smaller teams. Fees are less. And therefore, the younger members of the team have fewer people to turn to for advice than they used to. Yeah? So they're under enormous pressure. And that pressure is only compounded if the senior people of their team don't actually know what they're doing and are unable to give them advice. So this is a problem that really I wanted to address tonight, but I'm not going to address it directly so much as sort of by inference, by continuing to talk about projects that I've been fortunate enough to be involved with. So this is the water cube in Beijing, which we designed in Sydney in 2003. So to get this into perspective, this is 12 years ago. The PC was definitely now the staple you know, member of the design force, if you like. Everybody had one. It's what we used to do. But they weren't that powerful. They were just powerful enough to do the job that I'm going to describe to you. And I'm not going to give you all the background. I'm sure some of you have heard me talk about the water cube at inordinate length and been bored <coughs> stiff by it. So I'll, I'll try and stick to just one bit of it, which is the geometry and the structure. So it was the image on the left that I saw while we were doing the competition for the water cube that made me think, we do everything in triangles or orthogonals. Triangles are more stable, orthogonals are easier to sketch. What would happen, though, if we do this thing on the left? If that's what I thought nature wanted to do as a structure, then how would we go about doing that ourselves? In fact, I persuaded myself that if structure had free will and wished to occupy space, this is how it would go about it. Of course, you know, a bit of a nonsense idea, but bear with me. So we eventually found, by looking on the internet, another brand new thing to us in 2003, that a Professor Ware in Trinity College Dublin had recently published what he thought was the most efficient way of subdividing three-dimensional space. And by the way, now 20 years later, or, no, sorry, 10 years later, I exaggerate, 12 years later, it is yet to be improved upon. So it's one of these things that has yet to have a mathematical proof, but the foam industry, apparently, or the foam theorists, are beginning to believe it is the case that it is the most efficient way of subdividing three-dimensional space. So that molecule in the top left-hand corner is made up of um, repeating elements arranged about the three axes. And we just, using our computer, made a big block of it, a big cube, big enough to encompass our building. We put it at an arbitrary angle, and the, the reason for that will become apparent in a moment. And then we carved out our building. So top right, we took a 40 metres high slice. Middle right, and then the middle left, we cut out a 200 metre square on plan. And then along the bottom, we hollowed out the rooms, three rooms only in this building, in, in the water cube. And then we dropped out all the faces and kept the edges and said, that's our structure. And this is what we got. And that's what we did in the competition. And we won the competition. And it was only after we won the competition that I looked at what we got. <laughs> and um, to my rather, you know, rather shame and chagrin, I could not make it work as a structure. To me, it looks like a structure. It feels like a structure. It smells like a structure. But I couldn't make it into a structure because I couldn't choose the sizes of the 20,000 different members in an appropriate way to make it strong enough to work, and if I made them too small, it was too weak, and if I made them too big, it was too heavy. And I couldn't find the way in between. So no matter, we decided to turn to our friendly computer and devise a strategy of repeated analysis and member sizing until we got a solution. And we found, by experiment, that if all the members were set really, really small, and then we analysed it, and everything that was overstressed, and overstressed not to an arbitrary number, but overstressed in accordance with every clause of the Chinese Steel Code, we made it a little bit bigger. And then we ran it again. And after a while, of course, some turned out to be too big, so you then make them smaller again. 
as the forces flows through this incredibly, um, well, both complex but also not, um, not determinate structure, you know, work its way out. And we found, fortunately, that after about 25 cycles of analysis, we got a structure which worked, it stood up, and I'm proud to say it was roughly the right weight. So it was 75 kilograms a square metre for the roof and about 40 for the, the walls, which I think is not, not bad for a 160 metre span. And this is the picture of what you've got. Now, I don't know if you can see close enough, but there are some big fat pink members in there. There are some reasonably sized green members. There are some smaller yellow members and some very small red members. There are 10 different sizes of members in total, that's all. But how could I have guessed which one went where? You know, it just wasn't a possibility. More interestingly, too, is if you do it again, you get a totally different answer. Okay? <laughs> but it doesn't actually matter. Anyone will do, as long as it stands up. Then we took the next step. We now had all the information we needed. We knew where in space every member was. We knew what size it should be. We drew some more algorithms that decided what the collecting node size should be. We trimmed the members, you know, mathematically, if you like, in length to where they met the node. We then had a full definition of the structure in digital form. And this is the first time this has happened to me, that we could define exactly what we want inside the machine without yet manual or human intervention, if you will. Only human intervention by writing scripts that take you through the steps. So we got to the point where we could go from a change in the wall, which we had to do several times to make it more economical, was to shrink the building a bit, to producing a full set of construction information in a week because it was all semi-automated. And the advantage of that is you can do all sorts of things with it because you've got all your construction information, so you can look at it. This is not an architect's render. This is a view of the structural construction information. Everything you need to build this roof is in that image. You can make models, again for me a first, to use rapid prototyping to see what something should look like. This was actually from an earlier stage when I didn't know what size the members were and they're all the same size. You can also convey the information to the contractor in multiple different ways. So we produced conventional drawings, but we also produced, as on the left, stick diagrams with tags and then Excel spreadsheets or data sets saying exactly what each tag represented. What was that member? How long was it? What size was it? What thickness was it? And how do you trim the ends? So on site, the Chinese simply produced piles and piles of the different elements on the left. They put up a massive scaffold and they welded it together. And we got what's on the right. Whether what's on the right represents anything like what was on the drawings, I do not know. But I'm sure it has roughly the right material content and I'm sure it'll work. And when we took the scaffold down, that's what we'd built. So you now begin to see, perhaps, the reference back to the original photograph. The original photograph, by the way, was not an organic structure. I somehow thought it might be bone or some other natural material. It's a polyurethane foam. So lo and behold, it happens to fit foam theory and the um, geometry we happen to choose. So that's one of a fortunate coincidence rather than reality. And this is Michael Phelps winning his seventh gold medal in the pool. And in that Beijing Olympics, there were 45 world records set in the swimming center. And to this day, I will tell anybody who wants to listen that that was because it was such a beautiful space they were swimming in. <laughs> <laughs> and it was nothing to do with the shark skin suits that the Australians invented. Another project at Beijing was the, the Bird's Nest Stadium. I wasn't fortunate enough to be involved with this, except as a reviewer. But it did strike me when it was finished that it had two characteristics. The first was it was probably the most beautiful stadium ever built. And the second one was that the structure was more of a supporting act to the architecture than it was a fundamental component of the design of the building. By which I mean, if you look carefully at this image, you'll see that there's a 14 meter gap between the outer roof surface and the top of the bowl, which is actually filled with structural trusses that do the spanning action of this roof. So this caused me to speculate with my close friend, Philip Cox, a wonderful architect in Sydney in Australia, could we, together, design a stadium where the form and the structure were one and the same things? Did we trust each other enough? Could he trust me in particular to try hard enough to come up with a structural form which worked structurally but was also 
beautiful in his eyes, not my eyes, obviously. This is actually quite a challenging thing to do. Um, we did it as only a partnership of two, which made it a bit easier. You can do it with more people than that. But it was incredibly good fun and interesting, and I think we succeeded. And we did it again using computers. So I came up with a theory, which is a shell of shells, as I call it, which is we have an overarching shell action of the whole roof in both dimensions, but also we have little shells within it that keep the big shell stable and add some cantilevering action to deal with the fact there's a big hole in the middle. Having decided that was a strategy, we then built a parametric model whereby the red lines you can see here control the geometry of everything else. So we had rules whereby every other part of the geometry followed what we did with the red lines. So we could fiddle with the red lines on the left and we got a whole new set of geometry. We can then say, do we like the look of it? These are four different examples, a bit extreme perhaps, but you get the idea. Is this a better or worse option than the one we currently have on the table? We could, using the exactly the same software developed for the water cube, we could size it all. Is it more efficient? Is it less efficient? Have we got a better or worse structure? Just using weight as a proxy for structural efficiency. We also looked at the facade. Do we or do we not have good repetition in the facade panels? Because the risk here is every piece of the facade was going to be a different size. But we put a tolerance on the panel and said, how many panels do we need? And, as, I, as before, we said, what does it look like? So this is a computer render from 2005 or thereabouts. And this is what we built. So you can see we're now getting a pretty good handle on what something's going to look like before we come to build it. And this is it in use. And now you can see we have a roof that isn't 14 metres deep. It is a smaller stadium, by the way. But it is only 273 millimetres deep. At least the structure is, plus a cladding zone on top of it. So I think we achieved, more or less, what we set out to do. But it, it did involve, as I say, a, a leap of faith at the beginning of the process. Can we do this or not? Can we produce structure that is form and form that is structure and both parties be happy with the end result? And that's it from the River of Melbourne. And I think, I love this image because it's not a computer render. <laughs> that is reality. However, it does look to me a little bit as though we've dropped a computer image from outer space into the city of Melbourne. The next project's also in Australia. So this is in Brisbane, also with Philip Cox. And we're faced with designing a high-rise building between two modernist buildings, the left and the right, by Australia's most famous modernist architect, Harry Seidler. And our building was uncomfortably close really, to these two, but there was a planning opportunity and a zone had already been preordained to slot this building between the other two. And this is what it looked like on plan. So on the left, the two grey blocks are the two existing buildings on the left and on the right. And I've superimposed our building in the middle, which is where it eventually sat, but all we knew originally was that was our site. The difficult thing was that the basement and all the basement car parking and the loading docks already existed across the whole site. So we were putting new building on top of existing basement. And what's worse, in a way, is that the goods loading docked for the entire site, I get a, yeah, it's here, right through the middle of our building. So we had a choice. Do we adapt a design to fit the existing situation, or do we change the existing situation and put in the building we want to design? And we chose the former. We were in competition with a for a developer. The developer obviously was keen on minimum ca capital cost. So we decided to produce a design that worked in the existing context. So a consequence of that, the core is off centre. And it is not in the right place for a 45-storey building suffering the cyclones of Brisbane. It doesn't work on its own. So we needed a perimeter frame. The other thing is that the, the place where basement columns could be put through and piles installed with minimum you know, with ease, if you like, through the existing structure, were very only a few locations, and they weren't in regular locations. But we decided to make that, if you like, into you know, the, the reason for being of the building, which is compounded by outside the front, and I'll show you a picture in a minute, was this enormous fig tree sitting in the middle of the road. So we decided to start from this random selection of column positions and grow the building in a way where the, the growing columns, if you like, like trees, would also be the wind frame for the building. So how do you do that? How do you do this? 
I can tell you that that's the result. And I can tell you that we did it by writing two pages of computer code. And what those two pages did is they said, if this is the position of a column, the column grid we've got at the bottom of a story, let's use some random numbers to generate a new set of columns that do that story. And they go in all, whatever direction the random numbers push them. And then we test that set of columns. And we say, we ask a few questions. For instance, are they balanced? Do we have as many leaning left as right? Do we have as many leaning forwards and backwards? Do we have as many twisting left and twisting right? In other words, would they be a stable set of columns? Would they be useful? Secondly, we say, do they have enough inclination on average to take the wind shear as a natural way of carrying the wind shear? In other words, it, we said 10 degrees, because that was roughly the, the ratio of the wind shear to the gravity load. And the last question we asked is, have we got a reasonable span on the slab above? And the reasonable span, we just continued adjusting downwards until we failed to get an answer. You see what I mean? So what we do is uh, you run it, you get a set of columns, you test it. If it fails, throw it away, get another set. If it fails, throw it away, get another set. After about 10,000 iterations, you get a set that works. You move to the story above. You do it again, you do it again, you do it again. By the time you got to the top of the building, you've done about a million things of which 999,999 are useless. But you have one that works. So you do it again and again and again until you've got 10 buildings, all of whom work. And you go and friend, talk to your friendly architect, Philip Cox, again, and say, do you like them? Of course, the answer is no. <laughs> <laughs> but that's OK, because we say, why don't you like them? And then we go and tune the script and change it a bit until we get an answer that we do like. So you'll notice in the final one, the columns get a bit more exuberant towards the top of the building because there's less force up there. So you can afford to be a bit more exuberant. Down the bottom, they're pretty much straight up and down. They're not changing direction very much because we want to take that gravity load straight to the bottom. Yeah. This is the proof for those of you who are doubters and are engineers in Australia to this day who tell me they're decorative and they don't do anything. Okay? But I will tell you that they do. This is the gravity load. So you can see that all the columns, there's less at the back because that's where the core is. But generally, the columns are sharing the load pretty equally. And this is the wind load diagram without the gravity load, showing you're getting compression on one side and tension on the back face. Okay. They do work. And this was the miracle. This was the real breakthrough. This is our Revit model, the engineer's Revit model. This is the architect's Revit model. They are the same thing. For the first time ever, in my experience, the architect's drawings and the engineer's drawings are identical. Okay. What joy. And this is the result. So this was the fig tree I told you about at the front. And this is our building lit up at night. And uh, the last slide, the very last slide I'll show you, you'll see what it looks like during the day. So my middle sort of discourse or, or excursion is about design. So not about computers, but about design. For me, design is fundamentally an attitude. It is a sort of, it starts with a critical examination of what has been done. And then it moves into a, an ambition, can we do better? It's as simple as that to me. It's just, what have we done so far? What has been done by others? And can we improve upon it? And the improvement can be in any dimension. And I carefully say design, not innovation, because I actually don't think there is an awful lot of innovation in our industry, but I'm not an academic, so don't trust me on this. I think it's more about continuous improvement. There are small step changes on occasion, but it's more about just can it be done better? Can it be done better? There's not a lot of joy, in my experience, from just doing the same. The pleasure comes from new. And I, I used to lecture, by the way, and say that novelty was overrated that there should be no benefit inherent in novelty. I'm now being told that's wrong, that physiologically our brains give out chemicals when they see something new that makes us happy. So now actually I think it's the opposite. I think novelty is what it's all about, okay? <laughs> <laughs> this is what we should be doing. The second thing about design is you've got to focus on outcomes. So this was something that Peter Rice taught me early in my career. He said, Tristan, it doesn't matter how clever your structure is. The only thing that counts is how p other people will respond to it. Yeah? The cleverness on the way is immaterial. It's the outcome that counts. And so often we focus on outputs, as I think of it, not outcomes. 
And the last one is this open versus closed. And this refers a bit to how we use computers as well. Unfortunately, most engineers are trained in mathematics as their primary discipline. And the problem, I think, about that is that mathematics tends to be there is a question which is infernally difficult to solve, but there is only one answer. And we are trying to sweat blood and tears over a problem until we find that singular answer. And then we are right or we are wrong. But design in the real world is the opposite of that. There's an infinite number of opportunities. How do you choose which one to do? And so what I see amongst engineers working with architects in particular is engineers get really excited when architects pose problems that are almost insoluble because it's like their mathematical challenge. They now just have to find the one answer. As opposed to, they become almost paralysed when faced with a blank sheet of paper and asked, what do you want to do? Okay. I get paralysed with a blank sheet of paper. I prefer somewhere in the middle. You know, I like to start with a talk, a discussion. What are our ambitions? What are we trying to achieve? And then we get into trying to come up with ideas. But I do worry that we're educating people with the wrong way round, and we need to educate them more in design as an open-ended issue, not a closed problem-solving issue. So the approach, I think, so when I, I was made an Arab Fellow in 2001, I think, might have been 2003, it was a while ago anyway, I should remember, and I was asked when I was appointed, you know, how do you do it? What do you do and how do you do it? And I'm afraid I had to say I had no idea. I'd never sat back and thought about what I did. I just did it. But I now have thought about it a bit. And so I can give you two slides on how I approach design. So the first one, as I just said, is to think about the outcomes. What are our ambitions? What would we be really proud about at the end of the project if we could achieve it? The second one is to challenge the status quo. It's what I just said. Cross-examine everything and think about can it be improved upon. The third one for me is trying to work both sides of the coin, by which I mean I want to get both delight, something that's better, and efficiency, something that costs less. And cost can be measured in all different currencies, so money, time, materials, you know, full life cycle costing, it doesn't matter really. It's just the idea that success is doing more with less. Yeah. And then ultimately, our great good fortune as engineers is things get built. Things actually are made in the built environment and other people get to experience them. So you also have to deliver a solution accurately and reliably. That is definitely a part of what we do, but to me it's a part of what we do, not the whole of what we do. The process of design, and this is something I've actually pinched from Chris Wise and Expedition, is to conceive, analyse, judge. So another way of putting it is synthesis followed by analysis and then using your judgment. And it's very important, this word judgment. Is it better? Can it be improved? And then iterate back to the beginning and do it again and do it again and do it again as often as need be. And then this is my personal technique and it may not work for everybody. It's just what I do. So the first thing is understand the brief from the client. And I literally mean understand it, because reading the document you receive won't really tell you what it is that they want. It's probably in there somewhere, but it might be on the bottom of page 58. You have to go and talk to your client and other stakeholders to understand what's important. What do they really want? Second one is to get stuck into it, by which I mean actually start trying to answer the brief, try to respond to it. Because until you, unless you immerse yourself in the whole environment of the project, you can't do the next three things. Third one is research. What have you as an organisation done before? What have others done before? What is current state of the art for this type of project? Fourth one is set your ambitions. Look to the future. What do you want the press release to be? What do you want to tell the world when you've finished? The last one, or fourth, penultimate one for me, is to try doing it. Really, this is seriously. The first one was sort of immersion. This is really try and start the design process. And then the last one, which is a bit that works for me and may not for everybody, is you put it aside. You try and do something else. Perhaps something less stressful. And it'll give your brain a chance. I tend to, for me, all my good ideas come early in the morning when I've just woken up. I don't know why. 
but they do. And I've read somewhere that it is, there is some science behind this. It may be to do with our synapses getting rewired while we're asleep and that they're most malleable in the morning. Your brain is, you know, most flexible. Whereas at the end of the day, it's completely hardwired to the stress of that day, if you can see it like that. So we have um, three more projects, I think. So this is the Singapore Sports Hub. This is um, a stadium, as you might imagine, but it's a multi-purpose venue, really, because there is no sport in Singapore. So it's a slightly strange idea <coughs> that they want a national stadium. And they procured it via design and construct. So contractors had to bid to design and build a stadium. Okay, so it's quite important to see that this was being designed in a very commercially intense environment. So this is a cross section, and you can see the moving panels of the roof above you. What you ne don't necessarily understand from that is its scale. It is 300 metres diameter. It is currently, I think, the world's largest dome. There is a trick to that, which I'll come back to in a minute. But just before that, just uh, the first time, the only slide I'm going to show of other branches of engineering, <laughs> which is, of course, in Singapore, it's all about heat and light. It's all about trying to keep that tropical sun out of your stadium in an efficient way. So we have the fixed panels are as insulative and reflective as we can make them because we wanted the moving panels to be transparent to let light into the stadium. And then we have comfort cooling, which is producing air only at the right temperature, exactly at the seat, including things like it blows on the back of your ankles because you tend to wear shorts in Singapore and apparently at the back of your neck and the back of your ankles where the blood's closest to the surface and is great, most greatly affected by this cooling air. But for the structural engineer, the 300 meter dome, if you've ever tried it before, can be very heavy. And when it is very heavy, it has to be very heavy because it's holding itself up. So I've seen 300 meter diameter domes that weigh 300 kilograms a square meter, quite naturally, and they're fully utilized. They're not profligate in their weight, they just need it once they've got it. So the challenge here was to not end up at 300 kilograms a square meter, and you've got to do that by really rigorous, challenging goal setting, starting at the top, because everything supports the top. So the moving panels, how light could we possibly imagine they could be? And therefore, what target are we going to put on them and then design to that? Then we design the fixed roof to carry that load as it moves in and out and eventually work down the building. But you do it by deciding what the answer is before you start, not just by going into design. It is a complex structure. These are deflection plots. On the left, that's the dead weight with the roof closed. On the right, that's the dead weight deflection with the roof open. So the other thing is we don't want to be limited by deflection. So the other thing about the moving panels is we had to design them to be flexible enough to cope with supports that were going to move a lot. Because otherwise, again, you're going to be throwing steel in just to make it stiff. So this is the, um, basically the roof structure we ended up with. The big diagonal trusses are there to direct the thrust into the ring beam. So by, to get the roof to be light, you make a lot of the work done by the concrete ring beam down below. But the concrete ring beam is circular and really wants to get a radial thrust that's equal all the way around it. It doesn't want to have an issue where when the roof's closed, it gets a nice even thrust, but when the roof's open, it all goes sideways. So all the diagonal trusses are doing are, are taking that load and moving it to the ends when the roof is open. But there's something else about them, which is the thing I'm most proud of on this job. It was an architectural idea, and the architects were Arab, which at first thought, in a DNC world, you think was completely bonkers. At the top, the trusses are five meters deep and five meters wide, because that's what they have to be to efficiently span the hole and remain stable. But at the bottom, they're only two and a half meters deep and two and a half meters wide, because that's all they need to be where people come into contact with them. And they continuously taper from one to the other. Now, just imagine trying to persuade your contractor friend that you want him to invest his hard-earned money in continually changing the size of the trusses from the top to the bottom because you think it's going to look better. Okay? So the thing I'm most proud of on this project is we did. And that's um, the result, is this louvered space, which is still inside the dome but outside the enclosed area, is where people come into contact with these trusses. And you can see that they are 
roughly of a human scale. Whereas if they'd been twice as big, they wouldn't have been. And to me, this is that bit that I said that Peter taught me. How are people going to react to it? How are people going to engage with your structures and buildings when you've finished? And that is this um, stadium, which I still can't believe that's real, but that is. I haven't seen it yet finished. And it's got this open end as well, which is so that the, the people of Singapore, the city of Singapore, can look into the stadium, whether it's been used or not, and the people inside the stadium can look back at the city, whether it's in use or not. Two more. Penultimate. This um, project is in the Middle East. And so what do we know about the Middle East? We know it's hot and it's dusty, basically. And the usual way of dealing with that <coughs> is monumental masonry. Produce enclosures which are cool because they are thermally stable, because the desert gets cold at night as well as being hot during the day. So this was designing an airport for Kuwait with Foster and Partners, and this is their scheme for the airport. And it's, um, you might say, yes, okay, well, that's what, what a modern airport looks like, and that is true. But in response to being it hot and dirty, my friends at Foster's were determined that the roof would be made of concrete. Okay, make a roof of concrete. This is the um, airport superimposed on the harbour of Hong Kong. You wouldn't need the Star Ferry. It is 1.2 kilometres from tip to tip. Nobody has built a concrete roof of anything like this scale before, I don't think. Although, Jack, I was just thinking, well, how big was Bryn Mawr? Not quite this big. It also has a 60-metre cantilever as its leading edge in concrete. This is um, about the same as, I think, our first concrete high-rise building in South Africa, which I think caused some people in Arabs considerable consternation, but that went upright. This one goes horizontally. And its geometry, to give you that visual wonder of that approach, that rise and fall, is continuously changing. There is not one piece of repetition apart from the three arms being the same. So this is quite a challenge. So we came up with this idea of, of roof beams, which in the bottom of the diagram were tension ties, which do the fundamental cantilevering action that balance by a backspan, and shell structures above that span onto the roof beam and form the spaces in between. So we've got a 60 metre cantilever and about a 45 metre span and an 80 metre or so backspan. And we came up with the idea of fruit box engineering, as we delicately call it, of making panels about four metres square, which you can see on the right, where we have a, a thin concrete 150 millimetre thick panel with steel edges. The steel edges are flat, they're laser cut, hopefully they're accurate, and they're bolted together with cruciforms, bottom right, which are also accurately made. So the logic is, make the steel accurately, pour the concrete in the bottom, bolt it together, and you've got the roof that you wanted. Now, a shell roof for these sort of conditions would have to be 300 millimetres thick. So we're also using this as a hybrid structure with the steel keeping the concrete stable because otherwise it wouldn't have worked. Incredible amount of analysis to go into that. So we had to represent, most of the roof is represented by a hybrid panel as an approximation and some bits accurately. We used non-linear um, analysis using DINA where we model every bar, every weld, every piece of concrete, the plates, the bolts, everything to see how it really works. The 1.2 kilometres of roof does not have a single expansion joint. It's quite hard in a hot climate to deal with expansion and contraction without an expansion joint. Instead, every panel has a small expansion joint. In compression, it can cope with just movement. It just grows. But in tension, we have to let the joints open up slightly. So uh, all the delicate balance of stiffnesses, can you make that work? I don't know whether you can make it work. It's out to tender. <laughs> we'll see. But if it does, this is what we'll get. A 1.2 kilometre, not square, but triangular concrete roof. So back to the original theory, the original premise, computers. I probably already said this, but I'll say it again. They are our lifeblood. 
They, they invade every part of our lives, or rather we use them in every part of our lives. We use them for analysis and modeling, obviously. We use them for knowledge. How can I do that, um, that research that I advocated to find out what other people have done? You know, we do it via a computer. We use it for collaboration. How can we get remote teams working together? How do I get the best skills and expertise onto a project? But by using computers and collaboration. Ultimately, I think that we're going to move even from what we do at the moment, which is you know, BIM, Building Information Modeling, which is really a three-dimensional drawing, to a data set. We will deliver, I think, data sets, okay, just databases, in which there's all the information required to build a building or define what a building is. That's where we're going. The only way we're going to do that is with computers. You can't write a data set by hand, I don't think. These are just two quotes, because there's another aspect of, of computers. They will do some of the things that we do, or used to do. When I started at Arup, people talked about designing a beam. Designing a beam was doing a hand calculation, WL squared upon 8, or if you were sophisticated, WL squared upon 10, <laughs> and then working out what the reinforcement should be. Yeah? That was designing a beam. We won't do that anymore. That's going to be done by the machine. And on top of that, in the bigger world, I love this quote from King Lee Chang, who ran our LA office 10 years ago or more. Everything inconvenient will change. So what do we need to teach people? This is where I stray out of my comfort zone. As I said, I'm not an academic. I don't actually know what is taught at university to structural engineers today. I only know in detail what I was taught. So I'm suggesting that we still need to teach people the rudiments of how analysis works. And they need to understand matrices. I learned an awful lot by understanding S and C functions. They taught me a lot about stability, how things really work. And I'm added dynamic relaxation or other techniques. Yeah. But we also need to teach people that they can use the machine to explore structural behavior. You don't have to know what you're doing before you start. You can find out on the way, as long as you look at it from enough different directions. And you, so it's not a linear path. It's a very non-linear path. You have a look all over the place and work out whether something works. You can then start locating structural opportunities. What if, now that I know that if I do this, I get this result, what about if I took that wall out? What would happen if I added a column over there? I find it much easier to play in a virtual world by doing than to try and think about it. It might be because I'm getting a bit older and my brain's getting a bit tired, but it is much easier. So will we teach our younger engineers to use physics engineers engines with instant response? It's not structural engineering, but it does teach you structural behavior. Again, when I joined Arup, a Professor Bron, I remember, was hired by Arup to make sure that we all understood bending moment diagrams. Yeah? And he was similar. He was saying you don't have to know the maths. You have to understand what's going on visually. I think you can learn that by experimentation, not only by being taught, if I can put it that <coughs> way, right, by following your own journey and playing with things. There is the reliability bit, though, too. And this is where I think some of my colleagues are here saying, you know, we need to teach them to design without a computer. The reason for that is that some of the millennials are coming up with all sorts of answers which are plainly wrong. You know, the old rubbish in, rubbish out phenomenon. But that doesn't mean you have to stop using the computer. It just means you have to use it in the right way. You have to be taught how to check what you're doing, how to use lots of different models of different complexity. How to use different bits of software, perhaps, to look at things differently. How to chuck models away. This is what I'm very keen on. The model you use for concept design, bin it before you do scheme design. Start again. You may come up with a different answer. Then you wonder which one was wrong. Yeah? And lastly, sufficient accuracy. Well, what I mean is there is no answer. This is not a mathematical problem. This is design. There's both an infinite number of opportunities but as also, any given solution that works is good enough. It only has to work approximately. It has to obviously absolutely stand up. 
but it has to live within a locus of possibilities, all of which stand up. And there is no definition of what that is. So again, I get frustrated by people who sort of talk to me about something being 99.5% utilised. Only in your model, mate. If I build the model, it'll be 86.2% utilised. Yeah? So we've got to get into this perspective that it's all just different views of reality and none of it is the truth. But that doesn't mean it's wrong. So, I guess my proposal to us of the baby boomer generation. Please, 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 can we get our heads around what the kids are doing? Right? We need to teach ourselves what this software does and how it works. We need to be able to get into models and interrogate them. We need to sit around project tables of all people of all generations looking at the results of models. It doesn't come on paper anymore. We need to get into the digital world and cross-examine what's going on. We have the knowledge and experience. Only we can look at it and say it's wrong or it's right by instinct and feel. You can't expect people who are only just starting to do that. But at the same time, how do we convey that without getting into that world and doing it with them? So as I said at the beginning, for me, when I saw somebody proposing a course in Arab called Designing Without Computers, my instinct is, no, we want courses about designing with computers. How do we use them to best advantage? So my last project, this is a church. It's a church designed in 1890. I'm wondering if any of you recognize it. Apart from my wife and daughter. It's in Barcelona. And this is what it was looking like when they built the crypt, the beginning of the church. Then they employed Anthony Gaudí, <coughs> and he changed it into Sagrada Familia that you can see on the right. The red line, by the way, is the original church. So he made it rather larger, which is now giving them a, a minor issue. So we were asked to come and help them on the Mary Tower, which is the red tower, the front tower. And the reason that the Mary Tower is critical is it sits above the crypt that was built in 1890 and has foundations suitable for the smaller church, not for this church. So the question that we were asked is, can we design a lighter tower than they would have done on their own to put in this place? And the idea, oh, sorry, the first bit is that the tower is fully defined using um, parametric modelling in Rhino. So here we have a, a, a church designed in the early part of the last century, but is now fully computerized in its geometrical approach. And it's all an interpretation of what Gaudi himself would want, which, as you may or may not know, is partly available and partly not available, because all the models and the drawings, or well, not all, but most, were destroyed in the Spanish Civil War. So we know what we want it to look like. And we know what we've got so far, which is the base of the tower is already built. So that's, that's where we're starting from. And the Spanish had a, an idea, which was to build a steel frame, triangulated frame, such as you see here looking up the, the tower, and to clad it with concrete cladding panels, which had stone facing. So the inside of the tower, which is also publicly accessible, would have been concrete. And the outside of the tower would be stone, and the inside of the tower would also have a steel frame. And they came to us because they said they hadn't designed any steel work. And they mistakenly thought we knew something about steelwork and said, could you design the steel frame for us? And we went out and had a look at what they're doing at the moment. And it was, it, it is, this is the best project in the world for me because you have a client, a builder, and an architect who are all one and the same thing. And their only ambition is to build the best church in the world. And it's so refreshing to be sitting in a room where everybody who's going to make decisions is inside the room and nobody outside the room is going to contradict them. It is such a joy. But anyway, this is what they wanted to do, and we went to look at it. And we went to look at their construction yard, because the other problem they've got is as they get closer to finishing the cathedral, they get less and less workspace on site. It gradually occupies the whole of its block. So at the moment, they have a concrete process batching plant on site, they have a timber workshop up in the roof, and they have a stonemason's workshop on site. All of those have to go to make room for what has to be built. So we have to panelise and mechanise the construction site. They also have set an ambition they're going to finish it in 2026. Mm, okay. Are they or are they not? 
This is their publicly announced ambition. So anyway, we went to look at the way they were doing this, and what struck us was actually the steel frame was sort of, yes, okay, we need a steel frame. That's relatively simple. The problem was the panels. It was taking them a week or more to make this complex, doubly curved, concrete-formed panel and stone face it. And even then, they had to come to site. And at the moment, they're stitching them together to make the structure, which was even worse. Here, at least, they'd be hanging it on the steel frame. So we suggested a reversal of roles. We said, why don't you design the steel frame? And by the way, if we did it, it would look like this. And we'll do, we'll have a look at the panels. Because we had an idea. Okay? And the idea was, why can't we make the stone work? And it was quite interesting. They were selling us the idea that concrete was just modern stone. And we were trying to sell them the idea, yes, but stone is old concrete. <laughs> What's wrong with that? So the point here is a little journey of exploration. So I've looked back on my computer, and I've made 170 structural models in two weeks to try and understand how this tower works. I was not capable of taking this doubly curved form and working out how it works. What is the shear flow around this crinkle cut tower? How does it actually perform? What about the windows? What are they doing to it? No. How does it all work? So I find it easiest to get straight into a machine and start building models. So the first model is this one, where everything um, vertical is only compression capable. It is stone. And the hoops, rings, are tension capable, because without them you can't get a shear flow down the outside. And that's it under service loads, and it's actually working quite well under just dead load. And this, of course, is how traditional towers work. They're just self-weight of the masonry, wind load. But we were restricted to 300 millimetres of masonry because of the weight limit of the foundations underneath. But you can see what happens when I put the limit state loads on. It starts to get decidedly non-linear and decidedly um, difficult to make it stand up. So I then looked at it as big blocks. If we can make big blocks which were held together, for example, post-tension stone panels, now can I make a tower that works? And how would I connect those big blocks to make it work? I then looked at taking one or two levels of that and say, replace this crude approximation of structure with a finite element analysis instead. You know, get into more detail. And these are the stress flows of under wind load. These are through some of the panels. The red is tension and the, the green is compression. And then I added a pre-stress field. So this is the, the compression that you get from pre-stressing the stone both vertically and horizontally at the lintels. And you add that to the wind load, and at service, it's pretty good. There's not a lot of tension left. And where it is, it can probably be relieved by mortar joints with very small movements, you know, 0.1 millimetres or so. And under ultimate load, we've got a bit more of a problem. But is it a real problem or isn't it? Are those tensions a real problem? So I just took some of the blocks out. Said, OK, what happens if the mortar does open up? How far does it move? What happens? Yeah, and I've highlighted in blue there two of those. So I'm just trying to convey this idea that you play in this virtual world. And there's no consequence that comes from it. Yeah. And then we made one. Does it work? Does it work in reality? Is it faster to build? And I'm delighted to say that this panel took one day, not one week, to make. This is the very happy team of architects, project managers, and builders, and us at the back. And we then tested it. We then shoved it. Does our computer model represent reality at all? At the moment, I'm just doing that um, back analysis. And actually, at the moment, there's a bit of a discrepancy between the two. We haven't drilled that one down yet. As I said earlier, I think, you know, I believe I've got one of the best jobs in the world. And one of the reasons for it is you end up with something that has a profound effect on people. The internal space of Sagrada Familia is, I believe, one of the most beautiful spaces in the world. So if you ever go to Barcelona, if you haven't been since the Pope inaugurated the cathedral, or not cathedral, sorry, the temple in 2010, if you're ever in that, please do go and have a look. It is the most beautiful structure, and it is a structure I think I've ever seen. So for me, to have the honor and the pleasure of helping them complete it, by 2026, gives me immense pleasure because we've got six towers to go and we have recently had our commission expanded from one tower to six. And then we're going to do the main entry down at the, the south end, hopefully, fingers crossed. So thank you very much for listening to me. I hope I haven't bored you too much. <laughs>